Uh, I am here, David Andrews. If teacher is 10 minutes late, we don't have to stay for class. I made it in. I made it in just a few minutes late. I was waiting for my Nick Casario audio to load because Nick Casario spoke to Sean Pendergast and myself on Sports Radio 610 this morning. And I haven't really had a time to go back and listen to a whole lot of it. A lot of times when we're talking to Nick, um, I don't actually get to absorb a lot of it until I go back and listen because he usually – he. He talks a lot, and he leaves some really good nuggets, sometimes buried in between uh, some non-answers. So I thought there was some really good stuff today, and I thank Tyler Milner for cutting it up. But I want to go through free agency and Casario on his new defensive players and how the Daniil Hunter action came together, how Malik Collins fell apart. Uh, I want to go through the Joe Mixon scenario after it was reported that he was going to be cut and the Texans ended up trading for him, exactly how all of that went. I also want to get the injury updates on Tank Dell, Titus Howard, and Kenyon Green, which he talked about those guys. And I know that uh, I know the Tank's been a subject of conversation. As far as the jerseys go, I'll uh, I'll bring that up towards the end. I want to I want to make it through all of the uh, all of the stuff. I want to make it through all of the Casario stuff, but the jerseys. From what I can tell, um, a bunch of my friends had gotten to see the jerseys and the new uniforms, and uh, apparently there were some leaks today, so Cal just went ahead and leaked one of the actual photo shots of Tank Dell and Nico Collins wearing them. Uh, apparently, from what I can tell, the models that they used for the original jerseys did not do the jerseys justice. So from what I've seen, the, the uniforms look pretty damn cool. So, Genario, I will get to... My thoughts on draft day and all of that as uh, we go through some of the uh, some of the Nick Casario stuff. Okay, deal, deal. First question, um, and I, I shifted these all around so we could go by topic. Um, but honestly, just on the topic of adding Danico Autry, adding Al Shire, adding Daniel Hunter, Nick was at his best today when he was kind of just talking about the the finer points and the positives of guys like Danico Autry. And I'd ask Nick about Danico Autry being a defensive end, signed as a defensive end who can go down and play defensive tackle, but then the Texans go and sign Daniel Hunter, who's also a defensive end, and exactly how they were going to work this all in, whether Danico Autry could play more three technique in the past. Um, and, and Nick pretty much left it open to – interpretation here's nick on Danico autry but saying some really cool stuff about Danico autry at the end to the group so we're going to play eight or nine defensive linemen Danico has said this it starts with the front so we're just trying to create as much flexibility and optionality in front as possible um i would say specific to Danico, i mean this guy's a badass i mean this guy's a junkyard dog like if you go into a dark alley like you want this guy behind you like this is a bad mfer i mean and a really good football player who cares about football and, and we've had a play against him over the last couple of years and, you know, Tennessee, and then he was in Indianapolis, but you know, glad he's on our side and, you know, we're excited about um, what potentially he could bring to our front. How um, so that a hundred percent, Danico Autry, I think is that guy. He's a big dude. He's like Charles and size, but he's more of a complete and total player than, than when Charles and was here. I think Charles took a step forward when he was playing for D'Amico in, in San Francisco. Um, but to hear Nick say that he's a bad M. I prefer that's not that's nor normally Nick's deal. I also think that some of the things that I've complained about over the years would be that sometimes when Bill O'Brien or somebody else might want to go with high character guys, they go with guys that are like totally the person that you would want to help to your son for his Eagle Scout badge or something like that, but not necessarily badasses that you would also want with you in a barroom brawl. So I'm all for I'm all for Nick basically bringing the Necro Autry in just uh, to, to have muscle at his back when he goes yapping off in the bars. Next one was about Aziz Alshire, which is is pronounced that way. It's not pronounced anything like it's spelled. It's Alshire. Alshire, Alshire. Uh, and he used, a, he used a David Cully phrase, but I like it better when he's talking about Aziz Alshire and it's coming from Nick instead of David Cully's mouth. About Aziz El Shair, as long as we're doing scouting reports, kind of close things out on all the, the you know, the big. I'd say Aziz is a football playing Jesse. I mean, he's, what did he have, 160 some tackles last year? I'd say, you know, and this is out of like respectfully, Zaire Franklin is a damn good football player. Yeah. You know, I'm just saying there, there's some similarities between those two oh, players. Yeah. I'd say that their play style, how they play. Aziz has a lot of leadership, has a lot of toughness. Obviously, he has experience playing in, in this defense and playing for, for D'Amico. I mean, this was a guy 
guy that if we had the opportunity to add to our team, quite frankly, like we tried to add him to the team last year and it, you know, it didn't work out. And then we had to play against him and he, I think he made every tackle <laughs> in the Tennessee <laughs> yeah. game. So I would say the fact that Aziz is where he is, I mean, honestly, it's a credit to him and his toughness and his resilience. And the guy's a good football player. And we think he's, you know, going to be a, a big asset to our team and, and our program. Okay, the part about D'Amico wanting him last year, they weren't able to get him, and he went to Tennessee. There was an article written by a Tennessee blogger before free agency that said that other than Derrick Henry, who at that point everybody just assumed was going to be gone, he thought that the two players the Titans would least want to lose would be Aziz Alshire and D'Amico Autry. So that part's cool. Like, I'm all for taking as much of the Columbia Blue back to Houston as possible. And if Danico Autry and Aziz Alshire can uh, can whoop ass against the Titans twice a year, I'm all for that. The other part there I thought that it was interesting was Nick bringing up uh, Zaire Franklin and, and pointing Aziz as a guy that was kind of like Zaire Franklin. These are old school linebackers. If you watch Aziz Alzair, uh, Alshire and just watch the way he plays in comparison to Cashman, to Blake Cashman, and I'm, I'm not saying this is a slight against Blake at all, but Blake is more of an athlete than an old school linebacker, whereas Alshire is very much a good athlete, but is going to come up and pop people in the mouth. And he's going to sometimes not just sidestep a blocker, but explode up through the blocker. There's a lot about just like lunch pal carrying, hits you upside the head with his metal lunchbox type of, of play to Aziz Alshire. So I'm, I'm super excited about him. Very excited about Danico Autry. But obviously, Daniil Hunter was the big marquee acquisition. And uh, Nick Nick got pretty interesting talking about this today because the way it is these days, right? There's the combine, and everybody assumes that the GMs are talking to agents and what have you. That's not necessarily the case with the Texans, but also the agreements that people agree to and that during the legal tampering or perhaps earlier when combine uh, agents are talking to GMs at the combine, they don't always hold up, and and this part's fascinating, given how everything has changed with this legal tampering period. Tampering period. Um, this is Nick talking as we we're discussing the Daniil Hunter stuff. That not all the agreements that are in place stay in place. I had asked Nick something about how, you know, how did it how did it occur that it seemed like the interest from Daniil uh, wasn't known about until further into the free agency process. I would say the one thing you have to be careful of is sometimes, even though there's agreements in place, they really don't manifest themselves until actually Wednesday when you can actually, I would say, sign the contract or go through the medical process and just make sure that you have the player. I'd say it just seemed this year, maybe more than years past, there was a little bit more movement relative to player making commitment one place, and then you kind of saw a change of tune or change of heart, which goes back to what I said a little bit earlier. You just can't get too fixated. If you lose a player, player, then you just have to go to the next player. So I think what you try to do is after you kind of get through the first day, take inventory of who's still available, what are our options, and at some point the finances play into it. Okay, so if you think about what we know of the Texans, apparently they're in on Saquon Barkley on the first day. Didn't work out. Perhaps they were in, maybe they were waiting for Josh Allen, but then if he ended up getting franchised, um, look, that first day, the Texans were very quiet. We know this. A lot of people were freaking the hell out about it. And uh, and, I, and I said, just wait. Just wait and be patient. The Daniil Hunter, I don't know if if this means that Daniil Hunter kind of had been partly committed to somebody else, but then found out that, hey, there was a chance that maybe the Texans would be willing to meet some of what, uh, what he wanted. But I, I do think that, like, the fact that Daniil Hunter was available at all is a is a pretty extreme rarity. Like, I, I don't think he's gotten as much attention as he really should for the work he's done as a pass rusher over the past few seasons. And um, however those two sides realized that it was going to work out, that was when apparently the Texans had a deal in place for Malik Collins uh, to trade for Eric Armstead. But knowing that they had this chance at Daniel Hunter, which apparently they didn't before, they decided to go whole hog on in that. Um, I feel like it was. I feel like that had to have been kind of a risky scenario because if you whiff on Daniil Hunter and then you've already whiffed on the Malik Collins trade, you're kind of left SOL. So, uh, you know, Nick wasn't going to go completely into that, but I think that I think that might have been a ballsier maneuver than than we're probably giving him credit for. Maybe we'll get the full details at some point. So this was. Uh, I asked him about how they came to know 
that Daniil Hunter might be interested. I would say specific to Daniil, that was a situation where there was mutual interest on, on both ends and then we were able to come to agreement. I think we kind of came to an agreement sort of the end of the day there. It was late in the afternoon, I want to say Tuesday-ish, but that was another opportunity to add a good player to our team that we feel can help us. But by the same token, that wasn't the last order of business that we had in front of us. So you just have to be ready to act. You have to be very nimble. You have to be very, it's a very fluid. Those two or three days are very, very fluid. And if you have a good process in place and you have good people around you that you can rely on to get information about what's going on about a situation, then hopefully you can utilize it to your advantage and, and try to make the best decision for the organization. Yeah, and I don't know if it's included in these cuts or not. I haven't listened to all of them yet. But one point that he had made along the way was that he spent more time on the phones this first week of free agency than he probably ever has before so that ability to stay fluid and i think okay if they were going after saquon barkley and that didn't work out i'm totally okay with for two reasons one it was that i i didn't particularly want saquon Bar barkley um two is that if you if you want to you can outbid everybody else for every guy that you want and then you'll be one of those teams that will get praised for going huge in free agency but then all of a sudden two or three years from now you got to cut a bunch of people because like the dolphins or whomever else the, the bills you don't have enough cap space for some of the guys that you really want so i and and you also start to get a little too just cash crazy and not making really good fine tooth decisions about guys so saquon barkley wasn't my absolute favorite, but then also like in staying fluid and understanding and realizing, okay, the Joe Mixon, something like the Joe Mixon scenario might evolve. They wouldn't have known it at the moment, but they knew that something was going to come up and we'll get to that later. Um, as far as, again, he touched on how players sometimes change their minds in free agency. He weighed in more on that. This year, it just seemed like there was a little bit more, while well, a player seems like he's going one team and then actually it's, it's a little bit different and it's never done until it's done. So, but I would say in all fairness, once you have an agreement in place, I mean, we work with a lot of really good agents and there's a mutual, I would say, understanding and trust that's in place. But in the end, if a player has a change of heart, despite how uh, mad or emotional you may feel, in the end, the player has to do what he feels is in his be best interest. And we have to be respectful of that. So I wouldn't say that it happens all the time, Sean. I was just, I would say this year, it just seemed like there was a few more situations where mm -hmm. that popped up and you just have to be prepared for it but in the end the player has to make the decision that they feel is best for their individual situation and we're certainly respectful of that and if that's the case then you have to move on to the next player okay so i could read into this four hundred thousand different ways because hey we were talking about daniel hunter so did, did daniel hunter have a commit with somebody else and then he bailed because he wanted to go to the texans if so i say that is a fine young man who stood up for what he believed was there another player that perhaps bailed on the texans that son of a bitch is uh it doesn't doesn't deserve the same breathe the same oxygen as us so uh, it worked out for the best either way i don't know whether you know who would that might have been the texans had a similar offer to whether it was saquon barkley or whomever else I don't know. I don't know. Maybe more about that will leak out. The final piece of this puzzle was that, as I laid out, Eric Armstead was going to be traded for Malik Collins. Then the Texans found out about Daniil Hunter, so they went whole hog on Daniil Hunter. So I asked Nick, um, you know, why exactly did Malik Collins still get traded? Did that go as you planned, or was that the, the scenario that you were actually hoping for? I think every situation is different. It's always a case by case situation. I'd say in the Malik situation, there actually had been different uh, types of interest in the player at different points, um, going back to last year and then even during the course of the season. But, you know, we felt that, you know, keep Malik on the team last year was the best thing for us. And he helped our football team and did a number of good things. So our job is to evaluate and assess and listen. That's part of my responsibility to the organization. That's my responsibility to the staff. And in the end, take the information and then ultimately, whatever decision you make, you're comfortable with whatever the result is, whether it's releasing a player, whether it's signing a player, whether it's trading a player. So I would say in uh, Malik's situation, I'd say there's an opportunity for him to go to a great program or great organization with Kyle and John. And then we felt in the end, that was probably the best thing for him and the best thing for us. So that's why we made the decision that we did with his situation. Okay. A few thoughts on this. I think that 
reading between the lines and just knowing what I know about D'Amico and perhaps the way that Malik Collins played or Sheldon Rankins, I think there, I think a couple of things could be true. One is that the Texans wanted Eric Armstead, who tends to be more of a classically physical defensive tackle who can also rush the passer more so than Malik Collins. Um, but two, that the Texans may have wanted to move on from Malik Collins at some point, whether this year with Eric Armstead or next year, whenever else. By the time the player might have known that there was a player for player trade, and that not you weren't just trading him for for a draft pick or something. You were trading him specifically by saying, "Hey, Malik Collins, we don't like you. We like that guy." Um, and it's a guy that maybe you wanted to swap out at some point anyway. It might have been easier at that point just to say, "All right, we'll just rip off the band aid. We'll take the the late round pick for him." Should they have not worried about that and held out for longer or something? I don't know. The other part of it too is whatever deal they already had in place with the 49ers, if it was the Texans that was pulling out and bailing because Daniil Hunter was available, they have mel- they may have felt obligated to actually execute the trade with the 49ers. And I'm cool with that because you got to do business with these people. If you want, like Nick operates is a guy that's going to make a lot of trades. There's a lot of action and you got to, people got to be able to know they can trust your word. And like, if that mistake if it was a mistake, but they knew they were making a mistake in going after the bigger fish in Daniil Hunter, which is a pretty ballsy move, I'm okay with that. Um, it's not ideal, but at the end of the day, they're they're probably going to end up with more of the type of defensive line that they that they wanted originally. Moving on to Joe Mixon. So, just to recap, it was reported by Adam Schefter, Schefter and others that Joe Mixon was going to be released by the Bengals. And as we know, sometimes it'll get announced that a player is going to be released. And then lo and behold, a few hours later, or half a day later, that guy actually gets traded for before he can be released. Same thing happened with TJ Yates. Texans announced they're going to release TJ Yates. And then he ended up getting traded to the Falcons later that day. It's kind of a nice little bat signal you're throwing up when you announce that a guy's going to be released at some other teams. Like maybe the Texans were kind of scrambling. Maybe they had a plan for Saquon or Derrick Henry or somebody else. And then they realized that Joe Mixon might become available. Here is Nick talking about exactly how that started. With Joe, he was released. Likely he was going to be, um, I think he was going to be on a waiver wire probably the next day at four o'clock and then he would become a free agent. And then you would probably, there was going to be interest in Joe. Joe's a really good player. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be competition. So we try to get ahead of that. So we picked up the phone and we talked about it internally first. Like number one, do we have interest in the player? Do we think he fits? Okay. We feel good about the player. All right. That's step one. Step two, um, we'll talk about what you asked about there a little bit relative to his personal situation. Mm-hmm. Then step three was pick up the phone. Hey, would you guys be interested? And trading the player we'll give you you know whatever the pick was and we agreed to the trade i think you know and that's how we kind of came to the agreement we're able to acquire um the player on the team um and the commitment that we made to joe this is a player that has been a very consistent very productive very durable player over the last however many years i mean he's he's usually out there i mean he's he's got good balance he's got a good running style he's versatile you play in a passing game so from a football player standpoint we felt this is a player that we wanted to be a part of our program here moving forward Somebody asked me this morning, I can't remember if it was Sean or a listener, about how Joe Mixon makes C.J. Stroud better. And I I wouldn't point to one particular thing about Joe Mixon compared to Devin Singletary more than just simple durability. I think on a a yards per carry basis um, and all of that, Joe Mixon's a better running back. But First and foremost, he's a guy that gets 200 plus carries in a season, and that's his normal year. Whereas Devin Singletary last year was the first season he'd ever gone over 200 carries, and he's not really built like a feature back. The other side of it, if you want to compare, let's say, Devin Singletary of last year to Joe Mixon in this offense this year, I'll be very surprised if it takes the Texans a full half season to figure out how to run the football. And, you know, that obviously wasn't all on Devin Singletary. It was the Texans offensive line. It was the coaches going with Damian Pierce more so than Devin Singletary. It was all those things. But Joe Mixon has been in this scheme before or very similar to it. That's not going to be an issue whatsoever. The offensive line still has to get better. Um, The guys that are there already, I'm not even talking about upgrades. They just got to be better in this scheme, which tends to happen in an outside zone running base scheme. They tend to get better in the second year. Tight ends need to block better. And really, C.J. Stroud needs to have a better grasp and understanding of the run game. And he knows that. It's one of the things he's going to be working on in the offseason. I thought that was the one thing that Case Keenum actually showed when he was in, particularly in that Titans game, that I think he 
there were a few instances where I think he might have had a better feel for exactly which run to check to, how to adjust protections, all that, because he's just been in it for a decade. And it's going to take, it takes any rookie a little bit of time to do that. As far as Mixon's checkered past, the incident he had in college, um, there was an incident last summer for which he was found not guilty. He's, he's been pretty clean in the NFL, um, but he had a really ugly incident when he was at, at, uh, at Oklahoma. And Sean asked about how they, how they vetted all that. As it pertains to what he went through um, with his situation, absolutely, you, you have to consider it. You don't turn a blind eye to situations like that. So I think Joe, like you said, Sean, has, he's been in the league. He's been um, he's been a great player. He's been great in the locker room. He's been great in the community. He was a three or four time captain in Cincinnati. So he's done a lot of good things. You know, one incident from ten years ago well, it certainly doesn't define a person. I think Joe's acknowledged that, and you know, obviously it was a very difficult situation for everybody involved, himself, and you know, Joe was accountable that you know, he made a mistake. So, you know, I think we research everything. When I was in New England, you know, we were probably, we were having similar discussions. You're kind of going through and trying to get to the bottom of what do you have with the person? What do you have with the player? Was it an isolated situation? You want to be sensitive to everything that's involved. And then the further research that we did, and then even the folks that were here in Houston, part of the scouting staff before I arrived, when he came out, you know, they went through extensive research along the way and they, we were comfortable. Houston was comfortable with the player um, at the time as well. So, you know, we're certainly sensitive and cognizant. It's not something that you turn a blind eye at, but in the end, you try to make the decision that you feel makes the most sense. And, you know, we have confidence that Joe is going to bring a lot, not only on the football field, but is going to do a great job in the community. And we were willing to make a commitment to him to be a part of our program here for the foreseeable future. I think that there were a few key things there. One is that something he did that was really ugly as a teenager was something that he's accepted responsibility for. He and the, and the victim at the time, I don't know if reconciled is the right word, but actually had a conversation about it away from attorneys afterwards. And she's spoken positively about Joe Mixon and the the changes he's made and the approach he's had. He's been very active in the community there. He's, as Casario pointed out, he's been a captain for the last three straight years. I know one of you guys, yeah, Johnny, Johnny pointed that out as well. Um, you know, and sometimes the guys, sometimes the best guys to have on your team are leaders who have, who've been through it themselves. You know, there, there's some kids that are some kids that are there's some kids that are going to understand or at least learn about Joe Mixon's past. And if Joe Mixon is telling them about like what they need to do to to get straight or to get their life in order or what have you, um, there's some kids that are going to listen to him more so perhaps than than somebody else. So there's that. I think um, in terms of the McNair's signing off on signing somebody like Joe Mixon. I don't know if this is a huge change from anything that they've done in the past. Uh, you know, I, you know, they've they've signed guys who have had issues previously. I think maybe if it had been something that he had done as an adult in the NFL or something, it might have been different. Or if it were more recent, then perhaps it would have. But um, I think it, it probably is a little bit of a change in the guard in terms of the Texans not being so gun shy about any off field issues that they understand that okay, you're gonna. You're gonna have different. You're gonna have different assortments of people with different paths in the NFL. It's hard to find an NFL team. Honestly, it's hard to go through and, and find NFL teams in the past decade or two that it, the teams that have won Super Bowls go through some of the Super Bowl winning rosters and look at guys they have on their team that maybe the Texans would have thought weren't Texans worthy. You know, and okay, if a Super Bowl is won in the last moments or in overtime or something. Could have, that one player have made the difference? That one guy that the Texans were too good for. Like, it's just you, know, you got to have some knuckleheads every now and then. Joe, Joe Mixon's not a knucklehead now. I'm just saying in terms of the overall, you know, puritanical nature of the Texans' standards in the past, might be might be okay to relent a little bit. The other thing about Joe Nick, Mixon, um, you know, I, and I think this is Nick talking about players that are still out there and how it's a fluid process, but I thought it also applied to the way they came by Joe Mixon himself. There are still some opportunities that are probably out there for us to potentially add players, but our focus and goal is just to add players with the right mindset, with the right mentality that we feel can help our football team, understanding that the team building is very fluid. So we're going to kind of go to another sort of segment of our a fixed time of player acquisition at the end of April. And then once you get past April, there's going to be probably some movement in May. And then we'll have a little bit of window in June where everybody is kind of away. And then once you get back to training camp, there'll probably be a little bit more movement in training camp. 
then once the season starts, there's going to be a lot more movement. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this on the show as well. Like there's a number of players that we've added to our teams at different points, whether it was Danny Amendola the week before you know the regular season um, 2021, or whether it's a player like Derek Barnett, who we added midstream, or Tayer Tart, who we added midstream or kind of towards the end. Like That's just part of our job and responsibility to continue to evaluate and try to find players that can help our team and try to make the most of the situation when it presents itself. Yeah, and that's that's how I feel generally about let's say slot receiver, where you know, I, I don't know if if John Mechie, you know, comes and and maybe one year further removed from cancer treatment is a, a little bit more sleeker of an athlete, uh, or more explosive. I mean, it's 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 you can never figure with guys they go through that treatment. I think sometimes we act like, hey, he's in remission, everything's gonna be awesome, right? Let's not forget about all that radiation and everything you, you had to weaken your body to destroy it. Like it's a big deal. Remember Quesenberry? Quesenberry was like on practice squads and not really active much at all for like three years before all of a sudden he emerges back in the NFL as a starter. So I'm I'm willing to be patient with John Mechie. But obviously, they went after Keenan Allen this weekend, and they offered a deal that was probably, you know, slightly better than what the Bears offered for Keenan Allen. But the Chargers, uh, the Chargers decided to maybe just send Keenan Allen out of the conference. But I think it's a pretty good indication that, like, you know, there's a scenario that you might not have envisioned. You might think it might happen because the Chargers had to shed money. Yeah, he's a, there's another example of a team that spent really aggressively and now they're having to shed players. Uh, but the Texans, like they were bold. That was a bold move going after a guy and they gave what was a very competitive offer. It just didn't work out. But I think that Nick probably about the slot receiver position feels like there's probably a, a good chance at some time between now and training camp, either if not in the draft, but either via trade or a cap casualty or something else. Maybe it's Tyler Boyd who's still out there. Had a little bit of a downer of a season last year because of injuries, but just the, the consummate slot receiver. Um, I don't think they're going to panic about it. They're going to address it, but it's not so, like I'm not that panicked about it because they'll figure out a way sometime between now and then. Next question, still on Joe Mixon, um, was just simply about. Oh, okay. Players that want to play for head coach D'Amico Ryans. I think he's a pretty good recruiter, but he doesn't really have the, what you see is what you get. I mean, it's hard. Like who doesn't want to play for D'Amico Ryans and be associated with a program that he's overseeing and running? I mean, his juice, his energy, I would say his consistency, his honesty, his authenticity. I mean, those are things that players want and D'Amico has them in spades. And I think whatever conversations that he has with the players, like those are between, you know, D'Amico and the player. I think we understand what we're looking for. We understand the types of people and the mindset that we want the players that possess that walk in the building. Building. And I would say people and players feel that energy and feed off that energy. And it's real. I mean, you see it, you know, if you're sitting in the stands or if you're watching on television, I mean, that's who he is. That's what makes him, I would say, the great coach and the great person that he is. And I think we're all very fortunate to have him as our head coach. Um, what potentially he could bring to our. Oh, no. All right. I did something bad, everybody. I just skipped back. Hold on. Staff. And in the end, take the information and then ultimately feel in the end, the player has to do what he feels is in his be great program or great organization with Kyle and John. Yeah. And then we felt in the end that was mm -hmm. that step three was pick up the phone. Hey, would you guys be interested in training step the player? Three, a very durable player over the last hour. He's been a great player. He's been great in the locker thing. When I was in New England, you know, we were probably, we were having, so, you know, we're certainly sensitive and cognizant. It's not something that you turn a blind eye at, but in the end, then we'll have a little bit of window in June where everybody is kind of away. And then we'll just get back to evaluate and try to find players that can help our team and try to make the most of the situation when it presents itself. I apologize. I think he's a pretty good life. recruiter, but he doesn't really have the, what you see is what you get. I mean, it's hard. Like, who doesn't want to play for Demi? We're going to listen to D'Amico one more time so I don't get us skipped off here, okay? Nico Ryans and be associated with a program that he's overseeing and running. I mean, his juice, his energy, I would say his consistency, his honesty, his authenticity. I mean, those are things that players want and D'Amico has them in spades. And I think whatever conversations that he has with the players, like those are between, you know, D'Amico and the player. I think we understand what we're looking for. We understand the types of people and the mindset that we want the players that possess that walk in the building. And I would say people and players feel that energy and feed off that energy. And it's real. I mean, you 
see it, you know, if you're sitting in the stands or if you're watching on television, I mean, that's who he is. That's what makes him, I would say, the great coach and the great person that he is. And I think we're all very fortunate to have him as our head coach. Okay, got it. So I, I think you know, like Johnny Lambo. I was just giving you time to transcribe this, Johnny Lambo. Uh, those qualities that players are going to want from a coach, D'Amico has them in spades. Yeah, I, I thought the really interesting thing about the players like uh, like Daniil Hunter and I think it was Joe Mixon specifically talking about D'Amico and what they knew of him beforehand. I think, you know, some of it is just hearsay that they've heard from other guys. But you could tell that they'd noticed him being animated on the sideline. Like, D'Amico's excitement on the sideline and him, like, still looking very much like an NFL football player. Like, one of the more fit NFL football players. He doesn't look like an aging defensive lineman or anything jumping around on the sideline. That's that genuine excitement. And as a, as a lot of you guys pointed out, too, that mic'd up of D'Amico in the playoff game telling Christian Harris exactly how he was going to pick the ball, pick off uh, Joe Flacco and run it for a touchdown. <laughs> and then watching Christian Harris pick off Joe Flacco and run it in for a touchdown. If you're, I mean, Al Shire already knows that. Al Shire's learned a lot from D'Amico Ryans. But my God, if you're a defensive player and you see your head coach doing that, that's that's big recruiting. Because, man, I, I can remember so many of my coaches, the, the coaches I really respect and loved, would, would say the same thing, which is, man, at the end of the day, players want information. Like they want, they just want their coach, whether he's grumpy about it or whether he's nice about it or anything else, they, please help me get better. And, and sometimes you're just wishing, like you, you get stuck with a bad position coach or a bad coordinator. And you're like, I just, I just wish this guy could figure it out and get us better. Um, I think D'Amico's that guy that they just feel is genuine about it. And, obviously has the expertise to to show the defensive players especially how to get it done. Thus ends my dissertation on D'Amico Ryans and how much I love him. He might be the most uh, pure person in football. I just, I absolutely love him. So uh, as far as building a roster, you know, some GMs kind of work almost independently of the head coach or don't incorporate them into all the discussions. It it sounds like it's a lot different with the Texans. This is uh, these two are these two are communicating a lot uh, about what Nick is doing. I've said this multiple times. So I'm glad I get to work with Dr. on a day to day basis. Again, our conversations are very they're great conversations. They're very honest. We're respectful of each other's viewpoints. We listen. My job is to listen to him, and in the end, we have to feel comfortable with the people that we're bringing in. But I think we are very like minded in a lot of ways in terms of what we want the team to look like. And my job is to go out there and support him and the staff, and just make sure we're identifying the right players that fit the profile of what we want in a Houston Texan football player. You know, and I think one interesting thing about that is I think about some of the players that perhaps Nick was either re-signing last year. Like Malik Collins is one. Malik Collins got a new deal or an extension at the end of minicamp. So before we were ever in pads and before the defensive coaches had really congealed, I wonder if, you know, over the course of the year, Nick and D'Amico we're able to have conversations about Malik Collins and say, you know, talk about his positives, talk about his negatives, why maybe, maybe D'Amico would prefer more of an Eric Armstead than a Malik Collins. And there's, um, and I think there's a danger sometimes in thinking, well, okay, D'Amico runs a defense where everybody gets upfield and you play the, you play the run on the way to the quarterback. And that's, that's not the case at all. There are like Lovey Smith's defense was much more of that. I think in terms of, Hey, Let's get these defensive linemen moving. Let's slant them. Let's get them upfield. And don't worry about play the run on the way to the quarterback. I think it was more slanted that way in a Lovey Smith defense. D'Amico, I think maybe even more so than in a Robert Sala defense or some of the other people in those schools. I, D'Amico wants guys up front that are just all around badasses. That yeah, they can rush the passer, but they're also gonna they're gonna hit you in the mouth. They're gonna wrong shoulder on a on a kickout block. They're gonna do all this selfless just gritty stuff to stop the run and not every guy on that defensive line la last year was exactly that type of way so um that's i, I think that it, it takes a while i think a year or two for for everybody to get on the same page but it's cool to see that they're as cooperative and, and have such a good working relationship so uh, of course we asked him about trading out of the first round uh, and uh exactly so uh, basically i said nick why the hell did you do that or sean did 
Hey, hey, Nick, what the hell? We like first round drafts. We like being able to like to play along with the mock drafts for our listeners, but nobody really wants to listen to a, a second round mock draft. A lot of you sickos do, but like the average person on the street or in their car doesn't necessarily want that. I'd say the way we were positioned prior to the trade, we were picking a 23, then we were picking a 59, then we had kind of a late third and the two fourths. Um, and you have discussions during the course of, I'd say this time of year, I don't want to say you talk to every team, but you kind of talk to every team, whether it's about players. So as an example, with the trades that were done, you know, we did a few trades, other teams have done a few trades. So you're always kind of talking. And then you also have discussion potentially about the draft, about positioning. You know, we had the trade that took place last year between Chicago and Carolina. So different teams, are at different stages and there's going to be different dialogues about different things so we received a, a few calls um, about that pick and then you know we had a conversation with Minnesota about their situation so we kind of went back and forth and every situation that comes up we look at everything in totality we look at everything from a top-down perspective and make sure we understand the ramifications of whatever decisions that we make and so based on the discussions that we had and then based on the discussions that we had with Minnesota when that opportunity was presented we felt it made, it made sense for for us okay a couple things here one is as far as like minnesota versus the texans i think one thing that's really clear when you look at the deals that were done between these two teams it's that minnesota is a team that's thinking about i don't want to say far off into the future but as of right now they don't have a quarterback they feel good about um they've got some good players they can be competitive but i think they've got a little bit of a longer time horizon if there's one thing that became clear over the course of the past week it's that I think Nick and D'Amico think that this team can win big right now if they make a few of the right moves. The the Daniil Hunter trade especially. So, I mean, the Vikings letting go of Daniil Hunter, a guy who's still very much one of the premier pass rushers in the NFL, but he's 30 years old. Um, and they take on a younger John Grenard. It, the, that's, that's a team that's thinking, all right, Daniil Hunter might not be where we need him to be by the time we're ready to compete. Whereas the Texans are saying, hell yeah, we got a rookie quarterback on his rookie contract. We've got the cap space. We want this defense to operate like at the razor's edge. So we're going to bring Daniil Hunter in. So there's that. As far as the draft picks, um, you understand that Minnesota obviously wants first round picks. The Texans should want first round picks, but the trade, the trade works out in favor of the Texans. Like they, if you go by the trade charts and take the averages of what Minnesota's pick might be or what have you. It worked out for the Texans. So it's on the, like they got enough capital back that they could trade back up into the first round. Nick talks a lot about how he thinks about having groups of players and bands of players in the draft. I think that he probably likes the top half of the second round a lot compared to maybe the back half of the first round. Um, in that he, for now, might want to kind of sit back there and see the way things are starting to play out. And if he wants to move up and be aggressive, he can. I like a lot of the guys that'll probably be there in the second round um, with that 42nd pick. Wide receivers, obviously, there's there's bound to be a name that you really like. I think a few of the defensive tackles, I saw one of you said Brandon Fisk. Um, Braden Fisk? The Fisk kid, the big kid, um, are, are likely to be available. I almost, I wouldn't be surprised if, I don't know. I, I I'll be surprised if Johnny Newton falls to late in the first round. But I do wonder if some teams look at him and think, okay, he doesn't have prototypical size and they're not they're not as impressed by some of the other stuff he does. So I don't know. There's a there's a chance. Let's see. Uh, I think how smart it is to not have a pick in the first round. No one will care to speculate who will you pick so anything can happen. I like that. I like that thinking. Um, we'll get to a few of those other, other comments later. So the last one about their like Joe Mixon and some of the trades that they've done was uh, more about trading out of that first round pick and reasoning why. I'd say a big part of the discussion as well was getting a future second round pick. So anytime that you can acquire picks in future years, it just creates a little bit more flexibility and optionality for your team and organization. So, you know, in the end, we felt comfortable with the decision that we were making. Does it maybe potentially eliminate a certain pool of players? Potentially, but it doesn't mean we can't come back into the first round. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be good players available to pick. I would say we've sort of run the gamut here organizationally in terms of, of draft, I would say picks and or compensation from 21 to not having a first and 
and second round pick to 22. We had a little bit more flexibility. You know, 23, we had some flexibility and we traded up, I would say, to the top of the draft. So every year is different. I think we just try to be as open minded and flexible as possible, but also be responsible and just not make decisions to make decisions. But the discussions that D'Amico and I had throughout the course of the week and specific to this situation, we both felt comfortable. And so in the end, you know, we made a decision that we felt made the most sense for us and we'll kind of keep moving forward. Yeah. Uh, option. Are we certain that optionality is a word? I like it. I don't, uh, I'm not opposed to it, but I'm going to, I'm going to look it up real quick. Optionality. Yeah. Okay. Quality of being available, available to be chosen, but not obligatory. Okay. We'll go with optionality. Um, I, uh, it is funny to me that I, <laughs> they traded out. I saw some people's first and knee jerk reaction is, that somehow this was classic Nick Casario or typical Nick Casario, uh, and uh, or that he didn't he didn't want to be aggressive or what have you. Like this was the Will Anderson trade was the second most expensive trade for a non quarterback uh, up uh, up up for a first round pick ever. It was an incredibly aggressive trade. It was just it was the second most after the um, Julio Jones trade. Like it was an incredible, like it was aggressive as hell and it paid off. So I can't sit here right after Nick Casario put his entire reputation, possible job and career on the line to trade up for Will Anderson. And so far it's, so far it's really, really good. And it's working out. Um, I think he's just a guy that is going to pull off anything at any given moment. Nobody expected the Will Anderson trade and other than Daniel Jeremiah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think likewise, you don't expect that your guy's going to trade out of the first round. I still think there's a 50, 50 chance the Texans end up back in the first round, which is going to make draft night super interesting. Cause we're either all going to, we're either going to be super amped up sometime in the back half of the second for, uh, of the first round. We're going to be uh, just uh, waiting on pins and needles. And then we're either going to exalt or we're going to have draft blue balls and we'll have to wait until the second night. At which point he probably like trades everybody back into the third day or something. He did give us a few updates. I want to go through these three updates on Tank Dell, Titus Howard, and Kenyon Green. So first, how has Tank Dell been doing coming off of his injury? His broken tibia and fibia? Or one of the tibia and or fibia? Yeah, I mean, making progress. Ultimately, our training staff and, and doctors will make a determination about what um, a player's situation is. So, I mean, I'd be careful about reading, you know, too much into any sort of commentary or what's going on with a player. I would say certainly Tank, he's making progress. Um, and ultimately in the spring, you know, it was about doing what we feel is best for each player. But, you know, Tank's been here every day. Tank's working hard. So he's making progress. So taking it one day at a time. So, but you're certainly headed in the right direction. I think Tank is very possibly a guy that you have to almost like chain down to the training table to keep him from doing too much. The way Nick described that there is, as I saw Aaron Wilson reporting something from Tank's personal trainer about how astoundingly awesome he looks and everything. And I have no doubt that he does look astoundingly awesome. I think sometimes coaches and GMs get a little bit too nervous when a guy who's coming off of a big injury starts wanting to prove it in May or, or June. So I, I, they're gonna have to, I, I don't think that I don't think Tank was supposed to be blocking the dude that he was blocking when he got injured on that goal line play. I think Tank Dell just can't help himself because he's such a badass and he's going to constantly be trying to prove to people kind of like a, he's like a he's like a more mild manner Steve Smith, but has that same attitude, I think, of, oh, you think I'm undersized? Like, OK. And Tank doesn't talk the way Steve Smith talks but he plays like it. Like he's out there. He's not afraid of a damn person out there. And sometimes that work, work, might work against him. I also believe he's not afraid of his own tibia and or fibia. And I don't want that to work against him. So I think that Nick, Nick right there might have just been trying to pump the brakes and say, listen, if you don't see, if you don't see Tank Dell until training camp, don't freak out. It's not that big a deal. One other ninja injury of note, Titus Howard uh, coming off of injury. Titus is a tough dude. I mean, he's very tough, physically tough. He probably played more hurt than maybe people realized last year. And then ultimately, you know, we decided to, to shut him down or had to shut him down. So, you know, he's had a good attitude. Um, some of the pain has subsided. So I think the procedure that he had uh, had done hopefully will help him. But I mean, he's been here. Um, he's been here every day. Um, so he's starting to, to make progress. So, I mean, really the best thing for all these players is come in, work with our training staff, work with our sports performance staff, kind of take it one day at a time 
time as far as what the timing is when they're going to be on the field. We're not really too caught up in that. As long as you're just making progress and moving in the right direction, that's the most important thing. But certainly, you know, headed in the right direction. Titus Howard, um, tougher than I think people give him credit for was what Nick was saying, or he was more injured than uh, than what people realized. I think I just want to be sure on the timing of his injury. Surgery. Oh, he did a video? Yeah. November 29th, it was, uh, he was to miss the remainder of the season with his knee injury that Howard would undergo surgery. There was no timeline for his return to football. So obviously it wasn't, uh, he wasn't going to come back last year. I think Titus and uh, Titus's willingness to play guard again last year when pressed into action, which I, it was frustrating. I think the sheer number of injuries made it more required that he do that. I also didn't expect George Fant to end up playing as well as he did. You know, George George Fant ends up getting a nice contract. There, there are a few guys with the Texans this year that are good proof of concept that, hey, if you want to sign a one-year prove-it deal with the Texans, you can go off like Sheldon Rankins and get more money than you had the year before. Devin Singletary can go off and get more money than he did the year before. George Fant can go off and get more money. So, like, the Texans right now don't have quite that um, that New England Patriots allure of, oh, go go win a championship with Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. But I think they do have a little bit of that shine that, all right, man, look, they're going to play their balls off on defense. If I go play on offense, I'm playing with C.J. Stroud and some promising wide receivers. So some of these, when you get frustrated about some of the other spots that aren't filled in just yet, like cornerback, unless I missed something the last few hours, um, I think there are cornerbacks out there who are going to look at it and say, well, all right. I mean, Steven Nelson doesn't seem to be getting hired all that quick, but there's, I can go play here opposite of Derek Singley and on a one-year deal, maybe be like Tyron Matthew was for the Texans, go off and get another deal elsewhere. So I'm not, there are, there are a lot of cornerbacks, starting caliber cornerbacks, and there are a lot of starting caliber safeties out there right now. So, uh, you know, like even, even if, even if the Texans have their two starting safeties and Petrie comes along this year, it's always good to have – you play with three safeties a lot in the modern NFL, depending on what your nickel and dime packages are. Um, so I say all that to say Titus Howard back at right tackle is a good thing. Final injury update was on Kenyon Green, Aggie. He's been banged up a lot. Yeah, honestly, KG is probably as far along as he's been at any point. So, um, you know, he's dealt with a lot. Um, and, you know, I think he's excited about the offseason here. So I think this will be the f the first really offseason that he'll actually have the opportunity to train and actually go through an offseason program. So certainly moving in the right direction, um, doing some things outside the building that are hopefully helping him become a better football player. So, I mean, as long as they work hard, as long as they have the right attitude, as long as they show up, as long as they're diligent, can consistent. They're going to improve. And in terms of when they're on the field, we'll do what's best for the player. We'll do what's best for the team with really the eye that, you know, the most important thing is kind of making sure that they're ready to go for training camp um, when we need them. So I, we'll go through the spring. And once we get a little bit closer here, I think the, the official offseason program starts April 15th. So we'll kind of see whoever shows up where those players are at that time. And then as we get into May, we'll kind of see what sort of progress they've made. Okay. So Kenyon Green, uh, I know is, is a divisive topic. And understandably so. Yeah, he's a first round pick. You trade back when you could add Kyle Hamilton, you take Kenyon Green. And it's been a couple of miserable years of him just being injured a lot. And when Nick said he hasn't spent a full off season as an NFL player, remember he had that knee issue um coming into the league and and he just seemed like it was one injury after the other. Early in his rookie season, and then I think late in his rookie season too, when he was healthy, I thought he had some really promising moments. One of the roughest parts about judging him based on that rookie season was that he spent a good portion of the season when he was injured going against the gauntlet of some of the very best Dexter Lawrences and whatnot, like of the best defensive tackles in the league. There was, I remember Sean and I pulled up a list of the, you know, 10 best interior defensive linemen in the NFL two years ago after Kenyon's rookie year. And it was like he had faced like six of them in an eight-week period. It was absurd. It was crazy. And and he looked like a rookie getting the crap beat out of him by much better football players at that point. So there wasn't a whole lot to be about optimistic about with that. And then you go through and he continues to keep getting injured. All I hope for at this point is that his anatomical chain was so messed up 
that from having a bum knee and he ends up getting a concussion and he ends up hurting his back after that, that he just needed some time to just reset his body because he's a young guy to be having this many injuries. It doesn't make me optimistic. You know, his body type is a little bit more, um, he's a big dude, but he doesn't, he's not, it's not like he looks overly stout or anything. Maybe a little bit of maturity is all he needed. Um, but I'm not going to close the door on him completely. I do think that Juice Scruggs at center and then either Kenyon Green or Patterson or whomever else at guard are obviously the big the big question marks right now. I got to think at least one of those guys, either Scruggs, Kenyon Green, or Patterson is going to work out. And then maybe they get a journeyman um, or somebody else to fill in, maybe Kendrick Green. Um, but it's uh, that's that's obviously the point of discomfort. And yet, if the guys could just run the damn scheme, if the offensive lineman could just run it properly, four good offensive linemen and one substandard one is plenty. Like almost every Super Bowl is won by a team that has one substandard offensive lineman. It's a matter of the guys around him making it better and the coach and getting it right. I'll take some of your questions here. Then I was going to play. I've got um, Robert Mays and Chase Daniel from the Athletic Football Podcast. They talked about the Texans for like 15 minutes, and I thought they brought up some really good points. So I want to um, I want to talk about them. I'll work in reverse here just to catch any of the stuff that we've been talking about here. I oh, could have had Linderbaum too. <laughs> yeah, there's all, there's there's no number of people that you'll stop talking about. Well, the people we could have had if not for Kenyon Green. It's a lot of pressure on Kenyon Green. He's got to he's got to make it up. Okay, he, there's a lot of pressure on him this year. Um. Oh, okay. Uh, Gennaro, and I saw somebody else was talking about Tank Dell being targeted in the pile on that play. I I understand where you guys are coming from. I like personally, it just looked like business as usual to me. Um, the guy staying on his his leg. Uh, like he he had somebody else on top of him, if I remember correctly. The pile, it's not like you pop up all that quickly. Tank's so tough, he might not have been screaming. Usually if somebody's screaming, you're kind of like if like if somebody's screaming and you're on his leg like that and you don't get up, then that's super dirty pool. But I don't I'd be honestly really surprised. I didn't see that as targeting at all. I just looked at it as something that happens on a football play, especially down on the goal line. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Grim balls. <laughs> hey, maybe you're right. We'll get a, I'm going to, I'm going to find that guy. I'm going to get him in a bar and uh, give him the truth serum. Love, love tank. That little fella. Devondre sweat. Okay. Uh, Devondre sweats, a hot topic. 361 pound defensive tackle out of Texas. Who's just a stud of a football player. He's like a, he's like a svelte Ted Washington. And for you youngsters who don't know Ted Washington was, Ted was a defensive tackle who probably, I'm guessing, played at like 380. I don't know. Um, but was very, very nimble and could uh, could could play zone blocking schemes down the line, but also get some pressure. Um, I, I would say I would put Tavandre somewhere between Ted Washington and Vince Wilfork. So Vince was a really good athlete despite his physique. Uh, I don't think Tavondre Sweat is as good an athlete as um, as him, but I think he's probably better and more dynamic than Ted Washington. In the modern NFL, what does that get you? Or on D'Amico Ryan's defense, what does that get you? I don't, you know, you don't want a guy that can't stay on the field on third downs. The Texans rotate a lot, and I don't think that Tavondre Sweat would have to play more than 30 or 40 snaps a game. I could see D'Amico looking at Tavondre and thinking, all right. He's not my ideal type of athlete that I want on the defensive line. And yet I'm a big fan of kicking people's butts. And especially if you're on a team, if you're, if you're in a situation where, Hey, look, the 49ers this year, the 49ers had supposedly one of the top run defenses in the league and it failed them in the playoffs at various times um, or down the stretch in the regular season. Because a lot of that was a mirage. It was based on game situations and the offense having a lead. It wasn't really that the 49ers, when they absolutely had to, could buckle down and stop the run. There's times like that where no matter what your scheme is, a guy like Tavondre Sweat makes a big difference because those linebackers can run free. If you got some team that's just trying to run the ball down your throat and they're having success doing it, throwing a Tavondre Sweat in there works really well. That's where having two second-round picks might be more appetizing to Nick at this point. If he's got an inkling that, okay, okay, a few of these defensive tackles I really like. They're different body types. Um, 
than, you know, like Chris Jenkins is a much different body type and athlete than Tavondre Sweat, but they both intrigue me. I could see that. So, yeah, your Tavondre Sweat dreams do not have to die just because D'Amico likes a certain type of defensive tackle. I think Tavondre is athletic enough and can rush the – honestly, when he rushes the passer, it's not – like he makes human beings look like blocking dummies sometimes. He just discards them like uh, like disused tissue paper, as the Brits would say. That's, I learned that from a, a passenger lyric. 361 has to be a hard way to play at. Yes. Now he was lighter last year. So the, the big question is, all right, can Tavandre Sweat control himself in the city of avocados? And I like it because I was I faced the opposite problem. I came from a 4-3 defense where like at times I was playing, you know, 290, 295. I came to the Texans and they decided they wanted me to play nose tackle. And they didn't ask me to get big, but I noticed the bigger I got, the more fun it was. And then the one off season, I ended up like, I got up to like 335 and it was almost all burrito based weight. And I, I, I was sweating a lot of burritos by the time I came back. So Tavandre Sweat um, is going to sweat out a lot of burritos if he comes to Houston. D'Amico practices outside a lot. He prefers to practice outside. Uh, there's something about that heat that takes the weight off. It's a lot easier to be Gilbert Brown in Green Bay than it is to be Gilbert Brown in Houston, Texas. So I don't think Gilbert Brown would have been quite so big if he had played in Houston, Texas and, and had to block outside all the time. Heinish looks crazy with the face paint. That's a good attribute. It's a very good attribute. Sweat and Fisk. Fisk, I told some of you guys the other day, Fisk I'm really intrigued by because I like his athleticism. It's obvious. You know, he's um, he's got very good hands. He's worked at his technique. And then there's – so there's some games where I'm watching him and he's just destroying people. But then there was like the LSU game where there were times where he just couldn't even get off the line of scrimmage. Those guys really locked him down inside. So I'm thinking teams are probably looking at him and wondering – and I got to watch more of them, but kind of maybe wondering, like some teams did with Will Anderson, just like how is he going to fare versus the bigger NFL offensive lineman. And obviously Will figured it out and Will's been just fine. I think that somebody somebody by the – by midway through the second round is going to very much take a chance on Fisk figuring it out versus the big guys. Cause he's got all the intangibles that you want. The balloons. I can't figure out how to make them come back. Mira monster. I'm sorry. Um, let's see. First two picks got to be cornerback. Yeah. Kool-Aid McKinstry Leggett, the wide receiver. Yeah. We just got to, I'm going to get a deep and heavy into the, the draft after this week. So, okay. These guys, Robert Mays, and I just want to be sure. I believe I put it. Oh, I didn't put it in the description, did I? Ah, oh, damn it. I'll put it in the description when I'm done, I promise. Uh, but the Athletic Football Podcast, you'll remember the Athletic Football Podcast was the one where Nate Tice asked C.J. Stroud to explain uh, a couple of the plays that he ran this year, and C.J. was just brilliant on it, and that went viral. Um, that was on the Athletic Football Podcast. Today, it was, or this, a uh, couple days ago, it was just Chase Daniel, the former NFL quarterback, who was in the league forever as a backup, like in a highly paid backup to the likes of Andy Reid and whatnot. Um, and Robert Mays, who writes for The Athletic, super right guy, watches a lot of film. And they are very excited about the Texans' free agency. The, the, the part that caught my ear that made me go back and watch the whole episode was Chase Daniel talking about how the veteran players on the Texans would feel about the Daniil Hunter move and the Joe Mixon move, just the Texans' aggressiveness in picking up those guys. ...at home that plays for the Texans and you see the free agency they're having like capitalized by this hunter signing you're like saying oh my god like this is we are all in and it, there's just a feeling amongst the team that like hey we're not settling for just a playoff win like that invigorates some guys especially some veteran guys because i've been a part of a team where they haven't really done anything in free agency, and they're like, oh, we'll just draft. And it's like, oh, okay, ho hum. Like, we're just going to do the same thing over and over. But just from a standpoint of thinking, from a player's perspective that's at home, that's maybe on a three year deal that's looking at this, like, you were freaking pumped up. Okay. So immediately there, I thought of the Astros players in 2017 
when the Astros didn't make a move at the initial trade deadline back when there were two trade deadlines. And, you know, I remember uh, like Dallas Keuchel just flat out, flat out went public with it, right? And said that they were disappointed. They thought they were going to make a move or something. And then they go out and get Justin freaking Verlander. And if it hadn't been for the damn hurricane, um, it, it, especially like you can see how guys would get super pumped about that, especially when it's somebody like Justin Verlander. Daniil Hunter uh, does not have the same resume that Justin Verlander had by the time he got to the Astros, but it is that kind of move. Like when Chase said that, I was super glad that Chase said it because it got me, it, it took me back and got me pumped up thinking about like, holy crap, yeah. Like while you look around and your team is like, we're doing something here. And it does, it gives you that little bit of extra invigoration. The other thing that comes, that happens too, is that when you sign the right kinds of guys in free agency, when you sign the right kinds of guys in free agency they they feel that pressure to come in and not just be a leader vocally but be a leader by example like daniel hunter comes in here and people in minnesota love him right he's done every like everybody knows about daniel hunter in minnesota he comes to houston it's his hometown and he's the right kind of guy but he also needs probably feels a certain part of like having to prove himself to this team and it, it just, it's got a cumulative effect that's really cool. So I was really happy to hear Chase Daniel frame it that way instead of just necessarily making it about the X's and O's. Um, and then this was interesting too. This is Chase Daniel. I agree with him a little bit. I'll talk about it after, or disagree with him a little bit. I'll talk about it afterwards. But um, on the stress and pressure of being a quarterback facing a scheme like this or the San Francisco scheme that it's based on. And I'm just excited to see him like go out and play in this scheme because this mm -hmm. scheme, this 49ers scheme is, I mean, literally they tell the edge guys to just pin your ears back and rush the passer every single snap. Yeah, you like, play the I run on your care. way to the quarterback. Exactly. I don't care about screens. I don't care about draws. And honestly, at the end of the day, through three quarters or four quarters as a quarterback, you're like, these guys just won't stop. Yes, he's a really good passer, but his motor is insane. Like, he keeps going. I'm surprised the Vikings let him go. Um, okay, the very part, the, the last part there we'll touch on. He's Chase Daniel was surprised the Vikings let Daniel Hunter go. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, and again, you get into these situations where you want to reboot a little bit, but Chase Daniel's a 30-year-old, or excuse me, um, Daniel Hunter is a 30-year-old, and these are kind of chips passing in the night in terms of, where they are in their team building process. The Texans are a lot further along in their team building process. All of a sudden, lo and behold, than the Vikings, who looked like the Vikings were the next big thing just a couple of years ago. Now they're now they might have Sam Darnold starting at quarterback. Um, but that stress that it puts on a quarterback of just those guys constantly coming after you, the fact that they have Danico Autry now and Daniel Hunter opposite of Will Anderson, Danico Autry coming and rushing inside. Honestly, I know a few of you have asked about Dylan Horton. I don't want to get overly ambitious with Dylan Horton because obviously the cancer is the big thing and him coming back and being healthy is the big thing. There's things to like about Dylan Horton being like a D'Amico Ryan's type of guy. But I, I disagree with Chase Daniel a little bit and him, you know, maybe maybe he's exaggerating on purpose, but like D'Amico coaches these guys that give a damn about the run. And when you watch Will Anderson or John Grenard play last year, those guys are very cognizant of what their run responsibilities are. Um, Will is very capable of doing the selfless things when defending the run, coming down and wrong arming a, a kick out block, all that kind of stuff. So there's a there's a balance there, but the scheme, by virtue of playing these wide nine defensive ends, the scheme does invite those defensive ends that even when they're playing the run, they're just careening off the edge. So if it does turn into play action or pass, like they're there to put pressure on the quarterback. And the quarterback's always got that in their mind, not to mention you've got, you've got to chip him more, you know? So you're chipping Will Anderson, you're chipping Daniil Hunter. You're trying to, you're trying to offer protection up the middle because Danico Autry is coming up the gut. And then all of a sudden you don't have, you don't have a tight end out on a route. You don't have a running back out on a route and you just, you inject chaos into the offense. And now I'm getting super excited about it. This is, this is the good shit. This is the, this is the feeling I've been looking for. I've been way too analytical about this crap. It took a damn backup quarterback, Chase Daniel, to talk me into just exactly where the Texans are right now. Robert Mays points out just how rare Daniil Hunter's contract is. And you're going to be able to tell that this was probably recorded last Thursday or Friday um, 
because Daniil Hunter's contract is even more rare than the way Robert Mays puts it right here. Player in the NFL, defensive player, who has an almost fully guaranteed short-term contract at this age is Aaron Donald. That's it. That's pretty good. That's so pretty good. I think this says a lot about how rare a player he was to hit free agency yeah. and what the Texans thought of him in this process. So Robert Mays, I like, I love him as a writer because, you know, he's a big time, like played, I, I think he played in college, but he was a high school lineman, you know, he's fit and skinny now. Um, but I think when he watches film and like watches guys like Daniil Hunter, he knows what he's talking about. And like, he knows how hard it is to, it's hard to get a guy who's an edge rusher still in his relative prime in free agency like this. That was how rare it was for the Bills to all of a sudden realize they had a shot at Mario Williams because it just doesn't happen. Texans were in a spot where they had to shed salary and players. Um, you know, they just couldn't keep everybody and certainly not Mario at the at the price that he commanded. Daniil Hunter to get him on a two-year contract that's fully, almost fully guaranteed, 48 out of $49 million. Aaron Donald was the only one previously who'd had so many guarantees. But I'm like, I'm 100% about the fact that they did it in two years Daniil Hunter can sign a new two-year contract with the Texans in a couple of years, extend it next year, whatever it might be. But your your downside is limited after the first two years. And this is this two-year window where C.J. Stroud is a rookie. You've got all this space. These guys talk about that a little bit more to, to spread it out a little bit more. Um, but this is... Oh, okay. This is a really good point Robert makes about the number of snaps that Daniil Hunter has played over the years. He last year he played a thousand snaps for the Vikings, the wow. second most snaps of any edge rusher in the NFL. The yeah. only guy who played more than him was Max Crosby. That is not going to be the case playing no. in Houston. That's not no. how they want to play their guys. You're hoping that you can get even more mm -hmm. per down explosiveness and disruption out of him if he's playing a it's few less snaps. Yeah, and that's a that's a big point to make because I think sometimes. It's it's human nature, obviously. You see that a, a, a guy like Jonathan Grenard only played about 55% of the snaps. You want to say like, well, gosh, if he just played 25% more snaps, he'd have 25% more production. But it's just uh, the human body doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, the, it's like it's like in hockey. How you, you only go out for 60 to 90 seconds because you're grunting it out the whole time. If you try to leave somebody out there um for longer than their uh than their shift they're, they're going to be ineffective that happens with defensive linemen a lot when you don't rotate even the really really good players when they play 90 percent of the snaps they just naturally don't have as much pop in their legs so on a per snap basis daniel hunter is probably going to be better this year now so his production might be the same but the crucial part there is that he played a thousand snaps that's very few defensive linemen play a thousand snaps in a season and he had one of his best statistical seasons. As he enters his 30s, if he's playing 70% as many snaps as he did last year, he might still actually be more productive on a per-play basis. But you've also got Danico Achi, Will Anderson, any other rookies that they bring in to rotate with those guys. And it also gives opportunities for Danico Autry to play end or inside. Um, it just it, it, They're going to roll these guys through. So that part... Like unlocking a better version of Dene uh, of of Daniil Hunter is is very much a possibility. I'm not even just you know being irrationally optimistic or anything. Like yeah, he could take a step back and get injured because he's in his 30s. But likewise, I see a very clear path where he actually might be an, an, an even more effective player in this scheme. Um, to drive home the point about just what they're working with here this extra cap space that they have with CJ on his rookie contract. Robert compares the Texans to the Buccaneers. CJ Stroud over the next two seasons, 24 and 25, will count for about $18 million against the cap. Baker Mayfield on his extension will count for $50 million against the cap. So we're talking $30 million in savings for the Texans over the next two seasons for, again, what I believe could be upwards of top five quarterback play. Yeah, so for uh, Robert Mays, obviously pr very pro CJ Stroud. Um, it is, man. I, I've tried to avoid thinking too much about that rookie quarterback contract window. But in the last live stream I did, I showed you that graphic of when you take away Pat Mahomes, Peyton Manning, and Tom Brady, when you take them out of the equation, since 2012, eight of the 12 quarterbacks who aren't those guys have been quarterbacks on their rookie contract. So it's 
you know, that's it's still kind of a small sample size. And uh, Peyton Manning and those guys beat some other veteran quarterbacks who weren't on their rookie contract who might made it, whatever. But it's it's it, look, it's a very, very a viable way of getting to the Super Bowl if you're aggressive about it. The thing that I like about it, though, is that I think you see you see a lot of teams. They know that they go for it like the Dolphins. And then all of a sudden it doesn't work, but they're also left out in the lurch with some of these guys that they got to cut, still pay dead money on. And, and they end up like really scrambling when they should be riding this quarterback into a new era. And I think that what they hope to do with CJ is just this, these next two years, you can, you can spend a bunch of money on short-term contracts, spend a bunch of money on guys who are veterans in their thirties. And as CJ continues to improve as a quarterback, by the time he gets paid, A, you'll have you'll have maximized your window of opportunity in 2024 and 2025. But after he gets paid in 2026, and likely the the, the lion's share of that money won't hit the cap until 2027, CJ keeps evolving as a quarterback, and he's the guy that like Pat Mahomes can make do with an inferior group of receivers one season, or maybe the next season the defense isn't as good. But but you make up for that. The worst place to be is when you've got that quarterback, you've given him the contract, all of a sudden you have to start shedding salary and you realize, oh, crap, this guy's the same guy he was in year two or like barely, barely better than the guy he was in, in year three. That's where I think like CJ being as mature as he is, um, CJ being as focused, as driven as he is, CJ, unlike some rookie quarterbacks, just knowing that there's things he doesn't know. He has a humility about him where he just, he knows there's things he still has to figure out. And, and he's very open about that. And, it, and it's, it's hard to find the people that have the right amount of confidence, but also the right amount of humility. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act. And I think CJ has that. So I feel really optimistic that by his fourth year in the league, yeah, he's going to be a true veteran. You know, Russell Wilson in some ways never became that, next level veteran quarterback that that truly especially for a shorter quarterback he never made the the Drew Brees jump and and that's a classic case where man you know maybe if Drew Brees were as good an athlete as Russell Wilson Drew Brees never would have made that jump either because like Drew Brees by by necessity had to figure some of these things out with Russell Wilson he still relies on out of structure plays so much, but now he's not as good as an athlete as he used to be. Um, and it makes it hard to really project him on into, into greater things. Justin Fields this year might start in on that transition. If, if Arthur Smith can unlock kind of a, a few of the, the key things that he needs to do. I can't remember if I have that video or not. I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the Steelers video and also, um, Colby, you're complaining about the ads. I can't remember what I clicked on the ads. I used to try to keep the live reads out of the ads, but now I'm wondering if the um I think sometimes it might get optimized for the algorithm better if it's if it's if the live stream is monetized. So uh that's that's uh, try to get uh, get it out to more people. Someday we'll have a Patreon for two dollars a month and the hundreds of thousands of people who follow the Seth Payne show can not have any ads at all. I'll do it for 99 cents a month if we have 200 if we have 200,000 subscribers to a Patreon. I can't tell you how low I would go. One more on Robert Mays and uh that the message this part got me amped up too. So from relatively impartial observers Chase Daniel and Robert Mays, uh what does what does this Daniel Hunter move mean about where the Texans heads are at right now? The, the message the Texans are sending with this contract specifically, but I also think with the overall level of aggressiveness they've shown this week is we think we can win a Super Bowl in the next two years yeah, on a rookie. Quarterback. We know how good our quarterback is. We're not paying him anything. There's a chance we get borderline top five quarterback play for a rookie quarterback money over yeah. the next two to three seasons. Two, two, three, we are yeah. pushing it all in right now and not in an irresponsible way. Aha. I'm going to leave you right there. That's your screenshot right there, Robert Mays. Uh, I will link that, by the way, in the bottom after this, so you can go watch that episode. Uh, very Robert Mays at The Athletic is a very, very smart dude. I like him a lot. Plus, I think he uh, – I, I don't know if he says he used to be an alcoholic, but he quit drinking a few years ago, so he's tweeted about that a few times. Uh, when I quit drinking, I felt bad because I, I kind of quit drinking as an experiment um, and also just to learn about my own relationship with alcohol, and I kind of tweeted about it. But 
a lot of people thought that that meant that I was never going to drink again, which that's not the case. I can't quit her. I can't quit my, my lover alcohol. Uh, but I did learn like how I needed to be, uh, use it less as a crutch and actually just be, uh, I did be deliberate about it. So anyway, um, when I tweeted about it once, Robert Mays sent me a nice message, um, uh, you know, congratulating me for my sobriety and everything. And I felt really awful about it because uh, I just uh, I didn't feel nobody in my life had ever thought I was an alcoholic. Nobody told me I needed to stop drinking. I was just doing it for myself. But I would highly encourage any of you if you feel like you don't if you don't have complete and total control over your drinking, then try to abstain for like three months as a, just to prove to yourself that you can do it. And you'll start to learn in that three months, uh, be sure that you force yourself to do the things that you used to not do without alcohol. Like I would never want to, I would never want to go to a party without at least being able to have a couple drinks. Uh, so I ended up having to go to a boatload of parties and social obligations, stone cold sober. And it, it changed my life and the way I think about interacting with people. So that was cool. And um, as I turned this into an after school special, and the other part was uh, oh, like drinking alone. That was a thing that I never realized. Like, I was, why the hell am I drinking alone? So I stopped that for the most part completely. I drink on a podcast sometimes. You just can't quit alcoholism. Yeah, right. Yeah. Sorry, JB. I don't mean to diminish anybody's issues or anything, obviously. Um, so just, uh, yeah, no, if you got issues, my God, man, get your shit together. Like the stream every yes, please. Everybody like the stream. Sounds like my wife. <laughs> Daniel Bartlett. Oh, so um, so as far as the ads go, I was curious though in the life of Colby. I'm curious like how often are you getting hit with ads? But because uh, I think I plucked, I pressed the button for conservatively, uh, putting in their average, whatever. I don't know. Um, I'm gonna get going. And if you guys enjoyed the content, I'm Seth Payne. I played for the Texans for 10 years. I played in the NFL for 10 years. I played for the Texans for five years. I now do radio on Sports Radio 610. That's where the Nick Casario cuts came from this morning. Sean Pendergast and I um, interviewed him. And this is my first time to sit back and really listen and reflect on them. So thanks, everybody, for joining me. Uh, after those last clips, I'm super amped up about this free agency. Join me at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, Central Time. And everybody have a great evening. Thank you.